Come on. Yeah, man, this is going to be so good. So if you were just in our worship, I know you're watching online now, but when you, when you worship him, you set the atmosphere to receive what God has for us. And I want to just, I want to share and teach today, but I want to just, all I want to do is equip the church with such a mighty power not to sit there and go home and say, we had a great time today at church or, or I had a great time listening to this message, but I want you to get, I want you to get the chutzpah, as the Jews say, to get up and go, you know what? I've been training to play baseball my whole life. I think I want to play a game. I actually want to get on the field and do something. So I want to encourage you, and somebody, some people are here today, and many are watching right now, and they're saying, you know what, Joe? I just am not in the right frame of mind because the world has beat me down. So I titled this message today, Runners. And it'll start to make sense as I preach it, but I wanted to share that I don't really have it, I don't have it masterfully put together because I want, I want God in his revelation to just take over in this message today. So, but I do want to share this, that the darkness of the world, it has plans. The, the world's plans are, and the darkness are to weaken your ability to get up after you have fallen. That's the plan of the world. See, we're going to fall. But we're, the world attacks us. We're going to fall. But the, the ability of darkness, which is the enemy, darkness covers the earth, greater the people, its job is to keep you down where it is. Does that make sense? So it's the enemy that tells you to stay down. It's the enemy that tells you that the blood of Jesus is not worth getting up for. It's the enemy that shares and says that he has, you have been defeated by this battle that you have been in. That's the enemy's job. And I want to share this with you. I, I know there's a, there's a movie. I was just watching this little documentary on, on how the Rocky films have made such an impact on people's lives. A lot of them are biblical. When Sly wrote those, they were, they're biblical. You say, well, I don't, I don't like you quoting Rocky to the Bible. I'm not. I'm going to use it as an example is all I'm going to do. And... If any of you have seen Rocky II, that's a, really, that's a really powerful movie for Terry and I because that was our very first date back in 1979. <laughs> yeah. It was our first date in 1979. And when um, I remember sitting next to her in the theater, it was packed with people. And I remember uh, Adrian was in a coma and she was dying and Rocky was talking to her. And he was saying, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was he was saying now, but I just started chuckling. I thought it was funny that he was, the way he was talking. And I remember Terry on our first date looking over and going, why are you laughing? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> Maybe because I don't want to cry. I don't know. <laughs> but I want you to remember, I'm going to liken this entire message today, runners, to one scene in that movie that you can actually, for those of you that have watched it, you can get a hold of it. Those of you watching online, you can get a hold of it. Sly, if you're watching, you go get a hold of it too. And, and I want you to realize at the very end, he fights Apollo Creed for the second time. He lost in Rocky I. He's fighting him in a rematch in Rocky II. And there, it's the end of the fight, and they're just beating each other. One blow, of course, it's superficial. I mean, one of those blows would have put anybody down, but, you know, it's a movie. So there, this, Rocky hits, and Apollo hits, and Rocky hits, and Apollo hits, and they're just trading blows, and they're both barely on their feet. And it finally, and the music is climaxing, and there's one more blow, and Rocky hits him, but his exhaustion and his momentum has got him so beat up that they both fall to the ground. And when they get on, they're both on the ground, then it's that slow motion, one, you know, to get to, can, so can one of you get up before the 10 count? Who's going to be the winner? And of course, Apollo's climbing higher than Rocky, then Rocky's climbing higher than Apollo, then one goes a, a rung lower, and then one goes a rung higher, and it's just movie magic is all it is, until the end when Apollo can, collapses and Rocky grabs the top rope and stands up in victory, which would have went on to five more Rockies. <laughs> so, I know that's quite hilarious, isn't it? But here's what I want you to know. The devil tries to get up. How can he get up when he's already been knocked down for, for life? He can never get up again. So he fights you from the ground position, and misery loves company. So his job is to pull you down to the place where he is so that you run and don't stand. 
Now, if you watch the movie, and some of you are going to go home today and watch it. It's on some channel every day around the world. But if you go and watch the movie, you'll see the camera cutting to his wife, to his brother-in-law, to his trainer, to the people in the audience, to the mob boss he used to work for. All the people are saying, get up, Rock. Get up, Rock. The ones that love you are telling you to get up. The ones that don't love you, don't know God, are defeated in their minds, and they want misery to join their company. Does that make sense? So before you can move anywhere in your life, you have to realize that wherever the enemy is fighting you, he's fighting you from the down position. He's not fighting you here. He's fighting you down here. So if you want to take that movie and make it completely accurate, Satan wasn't even in the ring with Rocky. He was beating himself up. And that's what we do. We beat ourselves up all the time. And then we take ourselves down because the enemy is like, throw a right hook to your jaw, bam. Throw a left hook to your chin, boom. You're doing, a, and next thing you know, you're on the ground. He's like, now you're down with me, let's talk. But it's only those that can stand that win. It's only those that stand that go from generation to generation. It's the ones that stay down become runners because they run only until the next time he tells you to swing. Okay, so now, let me, let me I just built a little bit here. We do the same thing in our marriages. I'm just going to use that as an example. My wife and I have been together 39 years, and there are many times we could have stood or ran. I tell this to the church all the time. I'm transparent to the church. There were times in Terry and I's 39-year relationship where she was less than pleasant to me. I don't ever remember being less than pleasant to her. Okay, do you see how that just played out, church? How you just chuckled and laughed? Because we can always see what the other person does, but we can never see what we do. So the problem is not between... It's not always the other person's fault. Sometimes it's your fault. But you gotta stand and you gotta go, wait a minute, the devil is, is the referee in this ring and he's telling her to throw a right hook at her face and he's telling me to throw a right hook at my face. This is what you have to understand. We're not throwing them at each other. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the principalities of darkness. We're listening to the enemy in our head and we're delivering the blows to ourself. Amen? And so we're going to, one of us are going to end up on the ground. And when you get tired from beating yourself up, all you're going to do is run. Now, hold on a second. I'm building this, me this metaphor in your mind. You're going to run. And when you run, you're going to find yourself at the next destination thinking you escaped the previous blows when the one who was throwing them went with you, you. So when you stand, you defeat Satan. When you run, he just, tells, he just repeats it at a different location. Oh, come on, church. You getting it? Okay. Okay, you're cool. So anyway, um, if the enemy can get your soul, did I tell you? I never finished the story. So in 39 years, we have never run. That was my wife I was hugging up here. There are people in the church for the new time going, man, this, this is a wild church, man. Pastor just brings women up on the platform, puts his arms around them. That was my wife. That was Terry. 39 years. You could tell it was Terry because when I put my arms around her, she just goes. In her mind, she's going, I don't ever want to leave here. Isn't that right, babe? Right, honey? Hmm. Thank you, Eddie. I have one person on my side. So, so if the enemy can't get your soul, he will at least try to taint and delay and detour your calling and the mandate on your life. He can't get it because you already gave it to Jesus. But he's going to taint everything around you, including your life. So you'll be saved. Oh, yeah, you'll be saved. You'll be going to heaven. But you will be unfruitful, and you will teach the next generation to not even turn their eyes on the Lord. You'll be so unfruitful in your, in your joy in life that you're going to heaven, but the next generation is not because you're not even gonna introduce Jesus to them. Amen? 
Why? Because you run, and wherever you run, you throw at you because you have not stood and defeated the one that's trying to hurt you. So what you're doing is you're like, don't, you're just, you're used to living in misery and you're telling that next generation, yeah, what about Jesus? Dad, don't worry about it. He never shows up. He never shows up. He never fights my battles for me like he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, just so you know, we sang that song this morning, this is how I fight my battle. You don't fight the battle, first of all. The battle is yours. The psalmist that wrote that song says, this is how I fight my battle. How do I fight my battle? With praise and worship. So the, the, in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, he starts, he starts saying as the enemy was going to attack him, he says, get out there and praise God and worship him. And when you do, God fights your battle. So what heads up? You're not teaching the next generation that God defeats the enemy for you because you have chosen to not praise and worship him in your present day. So you say, no, I praise and worship him. Then let him fight. Then let him fight. And when you feel that first blow to your chin, you go, wait a minute, I'm in the ring. Why? I'll say that again. When you feel that first blow that attacks you, when you feel that spousal argument, when you feel that job mess up, when you feel the whole world collapsing, when nothing seems like it's going right, when your parents have let you down, when your family has let you down, why are you, why are you in the ring? Go outside with your popcorn and your expensive hot dog and watch the fight because if you watch it, you'll see the enemy is already down. God is not throwing blows at the enemy. This is what the world needs to understand. He just has his foot on his throat. He just won't let him get up. God doesn't waste punches on the enemy. He already defeated him. Amen? Okay, you're getting this. I like this. So in Psalms chapter 2, I'm going to take the whole bulk of this, this message just in Psalms chapter 2. That's it. Psalms chapter 2, starting with verse 1. I'm going to show you, this is David. This is the this is Old Testament. Jesus had not been born yet. David is a worshiper. A worshiper ties into God and God steps into you. So David knew things that we only think we know and we have Jesus in us. So we need to tap into this kind of worship to get a hold of this kind of understanding. Remember, what you're hearing is about Jesus. He's, he's singing. It's so powerful, people, that David took the understanding of what he heard from God and he put it in a song. That's what the word psalm means. Psalm means songs. So he's singing it. He's not just talking about it. When you talk about it, that's one level of understanding. When you sing about it, it's in you. Okay, so he's singing about it. So he goes on to sing like this, and he says, how dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? So watch this, he goes, look at how the power brokers of the world raise up to hold their summit as the rulers scheme and confer together against Yahweh and his anointed king. So it's what he's trying to say here is look at all the power that you, oh, I'm scared of, rise up to try and defeat God. When you don't realize you don't have to follow celebrities of the world, and I don't mean just physical celebrities, I mean anybody in your life that is a celebrity, you don't have to follow the celebrities because you have the power. You just need to follow Jesus because everything that is in him, they need. Okay, so he's saying these power brokers of the world, you rise up and you hold your summits to talk about how powerful you are. This is gonna get really good. You guys are gonna love it. And they come against Yahweh and his anointed king saying, this is how bold they are, let's come together and break away from the creator once and for all and let's cast off their controlling chains of God and his Christ. This is, this is David talking about the Pharisees of the world, the ones that we still have around us right now. We, I, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like a political war that just won't end. I, I don't understand that. I'm looking at the world. Get over it. Live your life. Get, government ain't going to hurt you. You got Jesus on your side. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about who's, you know, you heard the saying, don't worry about who's in the White House. Just start figuring out who's in your house, you know? So don't, because all these controlling people are getting together to try and cast down the Christ as it says here. Or if you want to translate it from the, he the Hebrew, it is actually the word Messiah, which is Savior, Christ, same thing, okay? So now, they're doing this, and these are the voices <laughs> of the same people who never got up. These are the ones that fell down at the end of Rocky II and said, I'm done, when all you had to do was stand up because whoever stands up wins because he's never getting up. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so you're chiming in from the ground level of how we're gonna defeat God and you're talking only to the one that has been defeated already. So the conversation that you're having amongst your defeat is with the one who's already defeated. Amen? So this is what, so I love this. I love the next line. The next line made me literally put the Rocky music on and run around my house and cheer. Because the next line is, God enthroned merely laughs at them. Can you imagine God in heaven looking down at the world, the corporate world, the world, the godless world, saying, look at them <laughs> trying to overthrow us. What are you talking about? What, what are you, high? What are you, that's, you're, they legalized marijuana, now you're actually smoking it and believing it. What is wrong with you people? Okay, I mean, God is just laughing at them. He, I'll say it again, he's laughing at them. God is laughing at them. I'll say it again, because no one's hearing me. God is laughing at them. So instead of you crying, why don't you enjoy the laughter with God? Does not the Bible say laughter does body good like medicine? So take your medicine and laugh. <laughs> okay, because the, when you're down there, if you're not laughing, you're tying your shoes and you're getting ready to run. You're gonna be, you're gonna run. And who are you gonna run to? You're gonna run with other runners so that you can say, we're doing the right thing. We're gonna run, we're down here. Let me find another person that is against God. Let me run with them. Because we will, we will feed each other's negotiationable egos when Jesus is up there going, oh my gosh, I really don't want to laugh at y'all right now, but I can't help it. <laughs> so he merely laughs at them. The sovereign one mocks their madness. That's what he calls it. Government takeover is madness to God. And the government of hell is always trying to take over the government of heaven. But the government of, that's like a president in office and the one that lost the race is still trying to get in. That's exactly what's happening here. He has been defeated. And God is laughing at him and he's mocking their madness. He's not only laughing at Satan, he's mocking him. So you say, wait a minute, I wanna know what that looks like. Okay, then the fierceness of his anger, he settles the issue and he terrifies them to death. So as they were laughing, as they were trying to, as the, the devil's kingdom in your life is trying to rise up, you say, Joe, what are you preaching on? I'm preaching the Bible, but it's paralleling with your life right now because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So everything I'm saying right now is for you. It's not, a, it's not a history lesson, it's a newsflash. He wants you to get it right now because he's alive right now today in you. <clears throat> yes, amen, thank you. So he, he, the sovereign Lord mocks him and then with fierce, fierceness of his anger, he settles the issue in good time and he terrifies them to death with these words. So let me tell you how God shut Satan up. He shut him up. And the same God that shuts Satan up once and for all, here, here's what you gotta understand about God. He doesn't change his mind. So when he locks the prison cell, he throws the key away and it cannot be unlocked ever again. So the enemy is convincing you that he has escaped his cell and wants to attack your mind and defeat your government of heaven with his government of hell. Can't be done. So all those out here right now and all those watching right now that are saying, I feel overtaken. I feel depression overtaking me. I feel oppression overtaking me. Change the atmosphere. Because you can only feel it because it's coming at you with the voices of reason that are all around you. But you have to understand the government of heaven that God is not only laughing at the devil trying to come against you, but he's silenced his madness already for you. How does he do that, you say? Let's just look about, this is David talking. 
He, it ain't even happened yet. David is seeing what's about to happen. We are already seeing it and saw it or read about it. So then this, this is how it happens. He, he defeats them with the, he terrifies them to death with these words. I myself have poured out my king on Zion. Yeah, people are like, it got to be good because you seem excited about it, Joe, but we don't know what you're talking about. He poured out his king on Zion. First of all, Zion is mentioned 157 times in the Bible. It's mentioned 38 times just in Psalms. Zion was a place, but it was not just a place. Zion wasn't only a place. It was a realm where Christ was enthroned. So what he is saying is, I have enthroned my king, the anointed one, on the throne and dethroned he that defeated this world. The fight is over before it begins because the enemy is not going to ever get up. You getting a hold of this now? So what am I trying to say? Everything in your mind is a mirage. Let me get to that in a minute. Let me not, let me not go too far ahead of myself here, okay? Hold on. So simply put, God destroys madness by pouring out Jesus. That's it. I'll say it again. God destroys madness by pouring out Jesus. That was in the Old Testament. So let me rephrase it. God destroys madness because he has already poured out Jesus. David knew it when Jesus hadn't arrived yet. He's already arrived and rose again in glory, and we're still toying with it. But that's okay. God understands it. He's the same sovereign God. That's why we love mercy and grace. We just love that God. So he goes on to say in here, he says, I will reveal the eternal purpose of God. Now, this is Jesus talking. He is singing Jesus' words right now. Jesus said, I will reveal the eternal purpose of God, for he has decreed over me, you are my favored son, and as your father, I have crowned you as my king eternal. Never gonna change, okay? Today, I become your father. So what, God, what David is saying here is there's a king coming, and God has anointed that king and established it and decreed it so that it could never be changed and the cross sealed it. So we're living post-cross with the same problems that the people of yesterday lived pre-cross. David didn't live with those problems because he had post-cross mentality in a pre-cross world. Isn't that powerful? So now he go, we go on, and I just think it's just amazing. So was God speaking that to Jesus or to us? Because remember what he said. He says, I decree you are my favored son, and, and as your father, I have crowned you as my king eternal. In, in Revelation, does God call us kingdoms and priests? So God wasn't just talking to Jesus right there. He was talking to those who received Jesus because he that is in you gives you the same authority because he is. So what he was saying is, I have, crowned, I have crowned you the heavyweight champion of the world in which no one can defeat you. So quit swinging. Don't even go in the ring. Just show up, collect your belt, and go home. I fought for you already. This is the God we serve. So how in the world can we move forward in life if we're fighting in the ring by ourselves and our coach is Satan telling us where to throw the next blow? If there's no one in the ring but you, who are you fighting? The enemy has you swinging at yourself. Amen? Is it putting it together for you? Or are you starting to understand this? Okay, because I'm almost done here. So then it is for you. I, I love it. If we just get up, we win. Simple as that. When... I just, I just can't say that enough. Um, then he goes on to say this in verse eight. He said, ask me to give you the nations and I will do it. And they shall become your legacy. A dominion, excuse me, a domain will stretch to the ends of the earth. Wow, your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth. Now, let, this is where teaching comes involved. Let me take you Old Testament, New Testament right here. Watch this. Say, I don't want a history lesson. Yes, you do. Just, just take the time to listen to this, and you aren't going to have those moments where you're on the canvas trying to get up in a fight you should have never been fighting. So keep listening to this. Watch now. He said these, he says, you are my, um, sorry. He said, ask me to give you the nations, and I will do it, God said. What did Jesus say in Matthew 28? 
Verse 19, he says, go and make disciple of all nations. He already has the nations. He just needs you to go redeem them. He already had, listen, you got to get this nation first, and then you can get that nation, and then that. You have to have Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the rest of the world. But God has destroyed it all. He, he has given you the ability to go as far as you want to go. But the only reason, when you, when you start getting, when you start picking up speed, and the enemy can see you running, he goes, you hear this, ding, 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 ding. And you're like... Okay, so he wants to give you the the nations, and they shall become your legacy. This is what he's telling Jesus. Your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth. Again, is God talking to Jesus or both of us? Well, if he is in us, he's talking to us too. Remember I told you last week, all the power of heaven, God said, all the glory my father gave to me, I give to you. He doesn't give it to you. He gives it to you by inhabiting you. And therefore, he that is in you has the power. He's not letting you control it. Trust me. We talked about that last week. Otherwise, the world would have been wiped out 10 times over because your neighbor pulled up on your driveway too fast. So we just don't, he ain't letting us control that kind of power. Same thing right here. The dominion will stretch to the ends of the earth. We love because he loved first. Okay, now watch this. We can arise from our defeat because he first rose. We love because he first loved, and we arise because he first rose. If he didn't rise, we couldn't rise. That's why it clearly says in Psalm 60, arise and shine for your light has come. That's Jesus. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Darkness covers the earth. Greater darkness covers the people. But the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. What are we worried for? What are we worried for? Come on, boss, let's fight. Let's fight, come on. Mm, mm. We're swinging, we're training, we're training. If you don't live in the, in, the, in the word, you live in the world. And if you live in the word, you, you train with the Bible. If you live in the world, you train with the heavy bag with your face on it. Okay. I'm sorry if you're not a boxing fan. I'm really not a great boxing fan, but if you're not, this message is a metaphor using boxing. We're not turning our church into a boxing ring. Anyway. So in verse nine, it says, and you will shepherd them with ultimate authority, crushing their rebellion as an iron rod smashes jars of clay. Wow. That's God's job. Does he not say in the Bible he disciplines those he loves? Does he not say that if he didn't discipline you, you'd be an illegitimate child? So when you're swinging at yourself, when you're, come here, come here, Zephyr, come here. I should have, I didn't know I was going to use this much. I I need both of my hands. Come here. So put your hands like this, like you're going to box. Okay, so you box at the girls' YMCA? All right. Okay. So when you're in the ring fighting, put your hands up and you're, make, make so I can control this. And you're hitting, I'm not gonna hurt you. You're hitting yourself, you're hitting yourself, you're hitting yourself, don't go anywhere. The Bible clearly says right here, God will shepherd you with ultimate authority. He takes your hands and he arrests them like this. And you looked at, at, at that as dictatorship. He's stopping you from slapping the snot out of yourself. He is shepherding you with all the authority and he's crushing the rebellion in you. Are you hearing me? Come on, Jesus. He's good, isn't he? Thanks, pal, for always letting me be silly with you. Okay, okay. So then he says in verse 10, listen to me, all you rebel kings and all you upstart judges on the earth. Learn your lesson while there's still time. Before the final bell rings, learn your lesson and get up and quit fighting in this ring of a battle that I have already fought for you. Generations upon generations, because let me explain this to you. If the enemy can keep you down, a Christian down, Satan is not worried about getting you. You need to know how he thinks. He's a, he's a kingdom mentality as well for his kingdom. 
So his thought is, how many people are going to come from your seed that I can destroy? So if God spoke to Abraham and said, in your seed is the Christ, then Satan says, in your seed is the defeat of Christ, and I don't have to raise my hand if you just keep listening to me. So Satan is not trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy your seed for generations to come. That's why you have to know who he is in you, the authority he is in you, the power he is and the position he is in you, and you are never going to stand because you're never going to fall because you're never going to fight because the battle has already been won. Yeah. Amen? So he says, praise him while you can, while there's still time. But verse 11 says, serve and worship the awe-inspiring God, recognizing his greatness and bow before him trembling. Now, trembling is a good thing. Don't bow before him afraid. When you get so excited and so overwhelmed and you're just, when a, when a bride or a groom is getting married, they're so overwhelmed. They're in the room and they're just shaking. They're trembling because of the excitement and the, and the awe and the nerves and the, what, the unknown that's about to happen and the people that are watching and will I do the right thing? He said, just bow before me and you will tremble because I have the authority and I will show you that I have the authority, but you have to bow before me and you have to to worship me while there's still time so that I can hold you up in my righteous right hand. That's how good God is. That's how much he wants to bless you. And he says, fall down before him and kiss the son before his anger is aroused against you. Yeah, God still gets mad even today. He has mercy and he has grace. And what calms God down is a good dose of repentance. And what really puts him at ease is when your repentance actually proves action that, can, that backs behind that kind of repentance. He says, remember that his wrath can be quickly kindled, but many blessings are waiting for all who turn aside to hide themselves in him. There is a time, there is a time where God's wrath will rise. There is a time where it'll flare up <laughs> a little bit bigger than we want it to flare but he's not that time right now. We, we, as far as I'm concerned, the trumpet hasn't blown and he hasn't returned yet. But I will say this at some point that we need to understand while we're on this earth that we need to quit having a pity party. And when you are having your pity party, just remember there's a boxing match with demons all around you watching you beat the crud out of yourself while Satan, your trainer, is telling you what to blow, hit and blow, uh, throw blows at yourself next. Amen. That's what's happening. So you gotta get out of that state of mind. You gotta get out of your pity parties. You've gotta get out of the ring. You're fine. You can't, it, it, it absorbs you, people. It absorbs you, you know? And you have to run from that, but not run from God. Because if you don't get out of the ring, you will run. Not real, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end what I started with. You're gonna run with the very essence of danger that you were destroying yourself with in that present moment, which was you. That's what I pray every day. Lord, let me be deaf to the world, hear only what you have me hear. Let me be blind to the world, only see what you want me to see. Because then you don't step in the ring. And when you do, and when you're in that ring and you're about to throw those blows, this is what people do. I'm not, and I'm just using this as an example, I'm not going to the assembly today. I'm not gonna go worship God with my friends. I'm gonna stay home and fight me. I'm going to control it because we, we always go to the side of control. That's where the enemy comes in. When if you go to the place where we assemble together, there will be, Adrian will be around, Rocky's wife. The, the manager will be there. The brother-in-law will be there. The friends will be there. And they'll all be saying, get up, Rock. Get up. Get up. You can do this. Get up. And you'll realize, and they're not going to be saying, get up. I'm using that as a metaphor. They're going to actually be saying, get out. Get out of the ring. Get out of the ring. The throne of heaven is coming to fight this battle for you, but God will not land in the ring until you get out. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen? Are you putting that metaphor together? Okay. My mind speaks in pictures, so I hope you can hear that. <clears throat> so the meaning of today's message, I'll wrap it up. Worship team, come on up here. The meaning of today's message is why would you run? You already won. That's the meaning of today's message. So I will liken the fear in your life to a little child, a little child, seven, five, eight, who wakes up in the middle of the night screaming with terror because there's a monster under their bed. 
Now, as I'm talking, this is who you are when you get riled up, me included. And your, <clears throat> excuse me, your loving parent comes through the door and says, what's the matter? There's a monster under my bed and it's got green eyes and it's got a long cape and it's got long fingers on its right hand and, and, it's, and you're describing it because it's real to you. And your mama says to you, there's no monster in here. Yes, there is, I saw it. No, you didn't. The enemy painted a picture and put it in front of your face. So then your mom gets you out of bed and we look under the bed to see what? The monster? No, nothing. <clears throat> because it's not there because it's locked up, defeated. It's never there, it's locked up, it's defeated. It's never there, it's locked up and defeated. So we have to realize that I'm here to tell you that the position of victory has already been claimed and deemed and you all you have to do is realize there's nothing under your bed. Stop running from monsters that don't exist. Stop fighting battles that have already been won. Get out of the ring and put this last thing up here that I want, Frankie, that very last thing that I had you um, put together for me. And I want you to hold on to this because it culminates the whole message today. God gave this to me while I was driving in my car. If you choose to follow the world, you will run from the powerless and end up nowhere. Take a picture of that. Keep it up for a second. Let them take a picture. Snap that. Put that on your, on your, your refrigeration Snapchat or your brain Snapchat. Quit, quit looking at all these other things. This is the victory of God. This is who he is. I want you to stand to your feet with me because we defeated him today. He is gone today. He is defeated today. His holy moment has, has, has been decreed and deemed a failure today. I'm talking about Satan. I'm talking about the mindset of those people watching online and the people that are in this room today. Don't just take this as another message. Take this as God-given word and say, who is trying to stop me from getting to where God has intended for me to go? Who is trying to stop my victory? Who, I'm supposed to be way over there right now. God, I need to come to you. I need to repent. Here's my boxing gloves. I give up. You trade in your boxing gloves for the championship belt because he won the battle for you and he will transport you to where you need to be. Somebody say amen. amen. But you can't do that if you do not know Jesus. So if you're watching online or you're in this room and you have not deemed Jesus the Christ as your savior, David did before he ever came. But he says all you have to do is proclaim it with your lips. Jesus, son of David, you are the savior of the world. You are the anointed king that God talked about in the Old Testament. You are the victor. You have defeated every dominion of hell. You have destroyed Hades in the grave. You have done all that, and you have set for me not only a victorious, eternal kingdom in heaven, but you have placed before me victory on this earth. If you haven't said that yet, you need to get right with Jesus right now. And then when you do, all this other stuff starts to make sense. Amen? Ah. Oh. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hold on, church. God has given us, and I'll say this because I want the viewing world to hear this as well as you. A few months ago, God has told, told me in prayer that I want you to grab just people from the church and let them tell their story and call it, tell your story. So every week, if you're not on our Facebook page, just go join revelationchurch.faith Facebook page. Just go join it and watch these stories of people just like you that have overcome all their trauma because of Jesus the Christ. Amen? Amen? We love you, Facebook world, Instagram world, and whatever world you're in, YouTube world. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Love you, church. Stay with me.